you, Mohammed. Thank you, Meta. And thank you, everyone, for coming here. And uh, thank you for the, that's, that. That uh, that biography contained even aspects that I've forgotten. And uh, and thank you, Meta, for for uh, I was saying Meta's under under promise over deliver uh, pitch is, is that this is meant to be the most controversial thing you've ever heard in this room. So uh, it. Um, it actually doesn't start as a very controversial point. This is, this is sort of a, uh, a love letter to Canada I wrote as, uh, uh, after spending 15 years living abroad and, and examining uh, my country of birth from a distance and sort of, kind of, kind of coming to admire and raise an eyebrow at some of the more curious forms of its development compared to other former uh, colonies. Um, and in a way, it was it was part. It grew out of a series of essays I wrote over a number of years, asking a couple key questions about Canada that I don't think get explored enough in the conventional history and, and analysis of, of Canada. Um, first of all, why did Canada end up having so few people? Why did most decades during its first century? and the, uh, of, of life, did more people leave Canada for other countries than arrive in Canada as immigrants? What did we do to drive people away? Uh, to what extent is that population de deficit a structural issue in Canada now that's going to cause us problems? Or more to the point, to what extent is the fact that we, d we developed in a way without concern for the sustainability of our population uh, a problem? And finally, uh, what would it take and more to the point, what would the obstacles be to the next period of population growth uh, that we did not address during the last 70 years when we tripled our population? Uh, what, what investments and interventions do we need to make to ensure that the next fairly inevitable period of population growth will be one that, that decreases inequality, that increases livelihood, that increases the inclusion of Aboriginal nations in in confederation and that, that uses the population growth to, to move us toward uh, carbon neutral ecological sustainability rather than away from it. So, so, but you know what, the way to start this I think, and this is something I've never done with the book I've written before, is, is just to read you a little bit of it from the beginning. I, I, usually, I usually don't like going to readings, I don't like hearing authors read their books, but in fact the best way to set the scene is just to read this beginning bit. Uh, which is a story about, about some relatives of mine. Around midnight, on an early winter evening, 180 years ago, my grandmother's great-grandmother stood in fury as a crowd of armed rebels forced their way inside her Brantford, Ontario house, demanding the rifles and pistols that she and her Welsh-born barrister husband, William, had spent the day hiding. The couple had armed themselves that autumn, and William had worked to organize a local militia in the certain belief that they would soon be joining an all-out civil war over the size, composition, and purpose of Canada. <coughs> Twelve of them came down to us in the middle of the night, demanding <coughs> arms. They had each suspended to their sides swords and rifles. They searched the house, but William, being a strong Tory, had the precaution to hide his guns and pistols. Catherine Lloyd-Jones, then 36 and a mother of three, wrote to her mother in England that year. They left disappointed, but told us to beware of the rabble. As the men departed in frustration, William yelled after him that he would be joining the fight, but not on their side. The couple knew these rebels, Canadian men from the nearby village of Scotland, Ontario, men who had resided in Canada for longer than they had. But Catherine denounced them and their fellow rebels as Americans, for she and other Tories saw their, these men's expansive and democratic ideas, their support of public education and open borders and elected governments as treasonous and foreign. I then felt alarmed and rather dreaded the consequences of refusing them arms, Catherine wrote. Fancy me, close to William's elbow, pale as death in my nightdress covered with a cloak. I think I could almost have fired at them, at them myself. They spent the next several weeks sleeping fully dressed with weapons at their side, prepared to flee the house, pistols in hand, and join the coming fight. What a country this is, my dear mother, Catherine lamented to her overseas family. This, this has come to nothing but war, and civil war the worst of all, being in danger of being shot by our neighbors. People are in danger of their lives unless armed with their pistols, even to go a mile from their own home. Little did we anticipate a bloody war which will eventually take place. Catherine's fears were only partly realized. Civil violence, 
rifle battles, and a serious national crisis did ensue. But the war that took place in the days after Catherine's letter, today known as the 1837 rebellions, would not prove as bl bloody or as lengthy as my ancestors feared. The reformers who launched and fought in the rebellion were tried and transported to Australia, forced to flee to the United States, or executed. What Catherine had in mind was a far larger but less violent civil war that had been underway as long as she had lived in Upper Canada. One that had been launched by Canada's British occupiers almost the moment the War of 1812 had ended a quarter century earlier. It was a war to limit British North America's ambitions, its size, and its purpose. While the enemies were often described as Americans, all of them were in fact long-standing residents and subjects of the Canadian colonies. The border with the United States had been slammed shut to migration after 1815, so the US-born families of Canada, who until the 1830s were the majority of, of English-speaking uh, Canada's population, had lived there much longer than most British-born settlers and had a greater claim to being the real Canadians. The colonial rulers did not hesitate to call this clash of loyalties and visions a war and to specify what they were fighting. Sir Francis Bondhead, the Tory Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, had urged British Anglicans, among them Catherine and William, to emigrate to the colony after 1815 by telling them they'd be soldiers in a, quote, moral war between those who were for British institutions against those who, who, who were for soiling the empire by the introduction of democracy. <laughs> the conflict involved much more than democracy versus British institutions, though. It was an all-out struggle to ensure that the emerging Canada would be a closed, ethnically homogenous colony whose political and economic function would be limited to the provision of raw materials to the imperial capital, and whose population would be restricted mainly to smallhold farming. This was a vastly different place from the pre-1812 Canada, though tiny and sparse, that earlier Canada had been defined by an ambiguous and open border, diverse immigration, and a free-flowing trade in goods, people, and ideas with the newborn United States, all of which were now forbidden. This was a war against expansion and openness. Catherine and William saw their ideas triumph. William would die eight years later when he fell off the back of a wagon. Canada's border would remain closed and tariff-walled for decades. Its immigration policies would allow only a certain sort of British person. Its economy would remain colonial, rural, and resource-based. This victory would exact a heavy and lasting cost on Canada. For the rest of the 19th century and much of the 20th, the new country would fail to attract people despite constant efforts to do so. Underpopulation would become a constant and lasting problem. So that's my starting point. What was the moment when Canada shifted from one set of impulses to another? Now, of course, there were, there were, there were patterns, that there, there were ups and downs in, in the Canadian history between that point and, uh, and let's say, the centennial. But what I, what I identify in the history of, let's say, the, the first century of Canadian Confederation and the half century before it is a set of policies that I call the minimizing impulse which were a set, a, set, a set of ways to run the economy, to, run the, to, to set up the social structure of Canada, to set up the governing structure of Canada, and to, and to settle the land of Canada that, that made it a place that, that was limited in its growth and, and would discourage people. The, the elements, of the, elements of, the, of the minimizing impulse are restrictive immigration, um, by which I don't just mean we, we, for a long time, tried to attract only British and then, and then British and a select group of Western European people. But we very specifically rejected people from Britain and Western Europe who were urban or had education or trades or, or entrepreneurial uh, ambitions. I mean, there were explicit instructions to immigration agents, both in the Macdonald era and the Laurier era and, 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 and and in the Borden era, uh, to reject people who sought to settle in cities or start businesses or, or do things like that. We, we had a national mythology that we were a country of farmers, uh, and then farmers and to a, to a lesser degree people working for rural resource extraction industries, and we rejected that. And the consequences of that, well, we'll get into the consequences of that. So restrictive immigration, ethnic homogeneity, 
extractive economic policy rather than rather than economic policy based on building building economies and and, and, and cities and centers of development. A view of indigenous communities as problems, not as partners, which emerged as a consequence of those first three things. Um, we decided not to settle our frontiers by developing economies there. We decided not to open our borders uh, to trade in North America, but to remain closed. So we settled the West by attempting to fill the land for strategic reasons, rather than to bring people in, rather than to bring people in who would form communities. Um, and that was a different settlement pattern from the United States, which had its, its own, which had its own problems with how it settled the West. But in the United States, they tended to, to uh, uh, have the people create the economies and then build the infrastructure around them. We tended to, we tended to try to, to fill the land in order to plant the flag on it. I mean, McDonald saw the CPR as a strategic tool to bring armies to the West to defend it against what he saw as an enemy of the United States. And, uh, uh, and saw settlement as, as a strategic thing. As a result of that, and as, as a result of the fact that, that we had shifted to a view of ourselves as, as, as having a certain colonial role, we shifted from seeing indigenous nations as partners in, in the nation building project, which they really had been seen as until the end of, of the War of 1812, to seeing them as problems or obstacles or something to be got out of the way and managed uh, bureaucratically, uh, with with tragic results. Restricted relations with the United States was another arguably causal factor. That the shift the shift away from a north south form of economic development, which had been going well until about the point I chronicle, uh, to an attempt to to main, to to serve as a, a storehouse of staples and a backstop for the British Empire. Was not a, was 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 what thwarted our development in many ways and caused this cascade of other factors that led us to have led us to lose people uh, and so on. Um, we continue to try to have the the an East West Staples economy long after it ceased to be really relevant to us. Um, arguably, by about the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the North American economy was much more important to us than 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 our role as an outpost of the British Empire. Of course, Brit Britain, Westminster, saw Canada from about the 1860s as not being something it really wanted as part of it. It, it, it was uninterested in the Staples form of development at all and was attempting to build trade relations with the United States. It granted confederation to Canada, essentially because Canada was a, was a albatross around its neck and its, its attempts to build relations with, uh, with, with the United States. And, we continued that really up until the end of the Diefenbaker era. Diefenbaker's attempt to build free trade relations with, with Britain was sort of the last really formal stab at rebuilding uh, that type of east-west relation. But we, 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 were left with a, we were left with the infrastructure for that. We were left with the lack of development of an economy. And that led to the final aspect of the minimizing impulse, the one that nobody ever really attempted to make an explicit policy, which was a shortage of people. People left Canada at enormous rates, usually at greater rates than they arrived in Canada. Um, and the, the, they were usually economic reasons. People attempted to make a go of it farming or running businesses or things like that. Stuff was expensive. <laughs> Importing things from the United States, goods were very expensive in Canada. You wanted a plow for your field, you wanted, you wanted the stuff you needed to run a farm, it cost a fortune. The markets were very, very poor because we developed expensive monopolistic markets through the CPR that cost a lot more than Americans were paying to ship stuff uh, uh, eastward. Uh, we, we developed, we, did, we had a very, we had a very limited, we had, we had a very limited market. We had very expensive goods. We also had, we also had a, a, a restrictive and an unpleasant form of government that people wanted to leave. So, during the great European migration of the 19th century, when 40 million people left Western Europe for the New World, every single decade of that period, more people left Canada for the United States than arrived as immigrants. We suffered a net migratory loss during the greatest growth opportunity there, there was. Um, during the total period between 1859 and the end of the Second World War, during that whole period, Canada attracted only 3.7 million, uh, 3.9 million immigrants from anywhere in the world, and it lost 3.3 million people to emigration during that period. 
And the research body of research suggests that people who left tended to be the more educated middle class people with the, the tradesmen and so on that we left lost. And, and, and we often very explicitly, of course, pursued those policies. There were ups and downs. People talk about the Laurier era. Uh, of course, it was, our, it was the greatest period of population growth we've ever seen. It was the greatest period of economic growth we've ever seen. It was the only time Canada's ever practiced mass immigration. Um, and it was, the, it was one of the few times during the 19th or the 20th century before the Second World War when, when people tended to come and stay. But of course, it was also in many ways a failure. It was, it was, that was the period when a racial view of Canada became dominant. And when restrictions based explicitly on race became part of it. There had been signs of that before. We all, we've all heard the things about MacDonald happily using the word Aryan to describe his ideal Canadian, which is a fashionable new concept at the time. But it was, it was the war of ideas in the 1910s that shaped the restriction of Canada's population growth for the rest of the 20th century. And, um, and I spent a good amount of time chronicling the, the Laurier-Borden Wars, which with nobody was an angel in. <coughs> Laurier made, um, made a lot of concessions to race hatred and things like that in order to stay in power and so on. But it was quite explicit. What, I mean, one of the most extraordinary periods of Canadian history was Rudyard Kipling's involvement in it. When um, he gave, in 1907, <coughs> Kipling, who had just won the Nobel Prize in Literature, gave a series of lectures across Canada, all of which were sold out. They were covered in the New York Times and so on. And um, his, he, he owned land in British Columbia uh, and had witnessed events there. And his lectures were called, uh, We Need Immigration, Bring the White Man In So We Can Pump the Yellow Man Out. And, uh, and his argument was the yellow man was destroying Canada, the Chinese and Japanese. Uh, and at that point, there were, at that point, there were good sized populations of, of Chinese, Japanese, and, and, and Punjabis uh, on the west coast of Canada already who were sort of a welcome part of the country. But Kipling had witnessed a race riot in Vancouver over a conspiracy theory that a shipload of thousands of Japanese was about to land. And it was the usual conspiracy theory about other colored people that you get when immigration happens. And it was a bad race riot. And that became a defining thing. Borden embraced the White Canada movement, uh, started echoing its slogans. Uh, and we had a war of ideas, really, about it, about the white candidate. Now, of course, white then uh, did not include Italians or Ukrainians, really, either. Uh, and both of whom had, had come in decent numbers. Ukrainians in really great numbers at that point had become a sort of integral part of the fabric of Canada. And uh, I have a question. Yes? Does, um, did white include uh, Catholic Quebecois? Was there a demographic bulge? The Catholic Quebecois were, were fleeing Canada in huge numbers uh, at that point. Um, between the 1870s and the 1930s, about a fifth of the population of Quebec left for New England. Um, the point that during the Laurier era, I think something like of the 20 largest French Canadian newspapers in Canada, 19 of them were located in the, in the New England cities of the United States. Um, and, and I, think, I, think, I, think, I think something like three of the five largest Quebecois cities in North America were in New England at that point. I actually have a little bit of Maximum Canada entitled, No, It's Not About the Weather. Um, because the extraordinary thing is, of those huge number of people who emigrated out of Canada, the efforts to settle the prairies failed um, because people left for the Dakotas mainly and Quebec's population absolutely hemorrhaged into New England um, because you really couldn't make a go of it in agriculture in Quebec. And, and Quebec's administration had really resisted the, it was really clerically run at the time, had really resisted the idea of allowing an industrial urban economy to develop because it was contrary to the, their values. So people left for New England and actually made good livings. And in fact, you, we now find that uh, there have been studies recently of sort of, um, outcomes among the descendants of people of Quebecois who migrated to New England and those who didn't. And you still have better sort of educational uh, attainment rates among the descendants of the people who did migrate outward than, than those who stayed. I mean, it's, it's lingered on for that many generations. The effort to settle the prairies 
was, was, a, was a double tragedy because not only did it devastate the Cree and the other First Nations who lived there, who, I mean, essentially, yes, we know, we shipped them off. We, th these were people who had been an integral part of the global economy, who knew how to work globalization for, for the benefit of Canada. They, they had been the, the, they had been the, they had run the fur trade industry and, 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 and had, and knew how, knew how to, knew how to trade interna internationally with it. They were relegated, of course, they were cleared off any agriculturally uh, fertile land to, to areas that are in the, in the, essentially were in the Canadian Shield. It's very interesting to look at it, overlay a physical geography map of Canada with a cultural geography map of, of where indigenous nations got uh, resettled and that, so, that sort of thing. And over that, a map of where, what areas of Canada now have the lowest intergenerational economic mobility. And it's the same sort of triangle. The area that's, that, has, that has very low intergenerational economic mobility is the same area through the borders over which many of the Cree were shipped to live on reserves. And that, of course, coincides with the border between the arable lands of the Canadian Shield in many instances and so on. But the people we sent in to settle the plains, um, despite giving them lots of land and, and, and a pile of money and that sort of thing, that generally failed until well into the 20th century um, because we simply dumped people onto the land. We did not make an effort to, to form cities and communities and the infrastructure of trade and so on uh, and development. And, and, and uh, again, that was, that was a net loss until the 20th century. I mean, the, the Dakotas, I think by the end of the 19th century, had a larger population than the entire Canadian West, mainly from people having left the Canadian West. Um, and in the midst of that, we had a lot, of, a, lo a lot of attempts to end this. I mean, one of the things I point out about those, that set of policies of the minimizing impulse was that in many periods, governments only believed in one or two of those things. They did not think, uh, you know, they, they did not favor ethnic homogeneity necessarily, or, or they may have had briefly more benevolent ideas about indigenous, non-indigenous relations. But once you pushed hard enough on the, what I call that spiral of, of minimizing impulse ideas, if you pushed hard enough on a couple of them, the others topple over. Uh, the attempt to keep the Canada-U.S. borders slammed shut to, to trade and other forms of movement tended to cause a spiral of factors, particularly when combined with a, with a, with a colonial resource economy that caused all the others to topple over. And the end result was always that people didn't want to stay in Canada. And I argue later that once you started to push things in the other direction toward a maximizing impulse, uh, uh, pushing hard on some of those things made the other things inevitable. Once, you, once you, we entered a period where we recognized we were post-colonial around or after 1967, and we started to, we started to, we pushed over the, the idea of ethnic homogeneity, we pushed over the, over the idea that we should be uh, uh, a British colony, we, we removed the legal requirement that all Canadians are British subjects, we didn't really remove it until the end of the 1970s, but, but we started to remove that. That caused another domino topple. That meant that, that meant that the, the, the pressure for in recognition of Aboriginal title as a constitutional right became overwhelming. First, of course, as grassroots push from Indigenous communities themselves, but suddenly the resistance from the Canadian, uh, from Canadian governments and, and courts uh, began to dissolve around that point, and we began to recognize it and finally enshrine it in the Constitution. Suddenly, the, those things toppling over made it sort of inevitable that we were going to open up trade with the United States for the first time since the 1850s. I should note, by the way, the 1850s was the only decade in the 19th. The 1850s was the only decade in the 19th century when we had free trade with the United States, or reciprocity, as we called it, and it was also the only decade when when more people arrived in Canada than departed. Uh, and you can you can trace some of the causal factors behind that during during that period. It was it was a, it was a period when forms of forms of development and growth started to happen uh, that were beneficial. Anyway, it was, um, we did all right despite that uh, century of loss. Uh, but we came out of the Second World War with a population deficit. And then we launched ourselves into another really serious war of ideas in the 1940s um, over whether Canada should remain a rural place uh, and whether it should 
we didn't really have a debate about whether we should take the victims of the Second World War and the Holocaust. We, 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 the, we, the consensus answer to that was no, uh, really until 1956. Although we quietly did, we did take some. We took Polish fighters uh, in the 1940s. We had, uh, interestingly, uh, a population of Palestinians quietly uh, resettled here as refugees in the 1940s. They weren't called refugees, uh, but they were. Um, we had a Caribbean population to start to immigrate in the 1940s through interesting loopholes. We had a huge, in, huge internal debates um, in the government about whether we should allow in Italians and especially Southern Italians who government memos said were civilizationally incompatible. Um, and in public, there were Harold Innes would write big essays in McLean's and Saturday Night saying the idea of allowing Canada's population of 12 million to expand to 20 million by the end of the 20th century would destroy everything great about Canada. It would, it would, uh, it would, we'd run out of food. Uh, we would, we would lose our identity. We'd become American, um, and uh, uh, it would be, it would, it would destroy our British identity. And just, and and there was a, there were huge debates about this. Um, and it ended up being resolved not by governments deciding <coughs> to change anything. And this is another part of the history of Chronicle. The big changes in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s, none of them were ever a matter of a government or a court saying Canada should be like this and then it, imposing a law that changed the fabric of Canadian society. They were all post facto recognitions by governments of courts by things that had happened on the ground in Canada and that had become changing parts of Canadians' lives. Canadians wanted growth and expansion and diversity, and, and, and it happened, and then we caught up with it. Um, we, throughout the 1950s, we had these huge debates about the Italians. The Italians were, the Italians were the, were, were the, the they were the, they were, first of all, they, they were the major labor immigration to much of Canada during the 1950s. There are other groups who were controversial, but the Italians were who, the people who first ended up noticeably filling the cities. My parents, who were teenagers in Hamilton in the 50s, remember their, the first thing it could recognize would be, be called ethnic food was what they called pizza pie, which was extremely exotic in that town uh, at the time. And the, the Italians were controversial. Um, the first time Canadians recognized a group of people as refugees and had a fight over whether to accept them. Because the Jews, we didn't, we didn't say they're refugees. Um, we just didn't accept them. Um, but it was 1956 with the Hungarians, when, of course, tens of thousands of Hungarians fled when the Soviet Union invaded to refugee camps in Austria, whose terrible privations and conditions would be familiar to anyone reading about refugee shelters today. <laughs> Um, and there was a public outcry, and the public wanted to bring the Hungarians. Uh, and this, by this point, the word refugee had become a concept because the 1951 United Nations uh, uh, Convention on, on Refugee recognized them as such. And the government, in internal memos that have come out in subsequent histories, uh, had a big argument within it. There were memos saying, look, a lot of these people could be communists, even though they're fleeing communism, and, and essentially they could be terrorists. And there were memos that said a significant proportion of these Hungarians are Jewish and, and not compatible with Canada and, and we shouldn't allow them in. And they dragged their heels. There was a public outcry. And the public of Canada essentially end up, ended up inventing this idea of the private sponsorship of refugees. Um, family sponsorship, which became the uniquely Canadian part of refugee infrastructure around the world. Canada is still really the only place that does that. Mainly because a lot of people formed, they held meetings and rallies and, and said let's let's sponsor the Hungarians, and and the government finally backed down and allowed it. And of course, something like fifty thousand were were settled uh, over a couple of years, and very quickly became very as as often the case of refugees. Canada's refugee history is, is often a matter of, of siphoning the successful middle class off uh, out of uh, conflict ridden countries, and and the Hungarians became you know the people who ran Barrett Gold and, and opened the restaurants on Bloor Street, et cetera, et cetera, being very successful. And really, that entire debate fit the pattern of every refugee crisis that Canada saw since then. But also of so many other things involving Canada's population growth and immigration, in that, in that first it was the lived reality 
of Canadians that changed. I mean, by, by the time the 1960s rolled around and we were having a national debate about whether we were bicultural, the by and by committee, um, Canadian, the lives of the Canadian public had already long eclipsed that idea. Um, remember, in 1967, the idea that we were two peoples was so controversial. I mean, Diefenbaker spent all of 1967 standing up in Parliament and saying, if you dare suggest there's an English and a French Canada, that will destroy Confederation and should never be allowed. And, uh, and, and never mind Indigenous Canada. Indigenous peoples had only won the vote in 1961 and, uh, uh, and had only begun to agitate and, and become activists for, for further status at around that point. That was not even included in it. But the, the By and By Commission eventually ended up saying, well, there's this other thing that they called the Third Force, or um, what they were starting to call New Canadians by then, people whose ancestry was not British or French or Indigenous. And by that time, by 1967, one out of five Canadians had that Third Force <coughs> ancestry, was, was, had ancestry that was Chinese or Japanese or Sikh or Ukrainian or Italian or something like that. And it was no longer a controversial thing for people on the streets. Um, Rob Vipon here at U of T at, at Monk, he, he has a history out right now of uh, Clinton Street School, primary school in Toronto, which is a very interesting way of looking at this because it, it's, it's basically how the institutions of Canada and, and the private lives of Canada adapted to population growth and diversity in, in ways that hadn't yet been privately been, been recognized by governments or anything yet. I mean, they went from being a school that was 90% was, uh, Jewish in the early 1950s because of Eastern European immigration to being a school that was 90% Catholics by, by the 1960s because of the number of Portuguese and Italians coming in <coughs> and where what we came to call English as a second language had to be invented and they basically improvised the system that Canada has now of teaching English out integrating it into the classroom so that you don't segregate kids and that sort of thing. They even used the word multiculturalism about 15 years before anyone else in Canada did to describe that situation. So by the time things like official non-white immigration was allowed at the end of the 1960s and the official multiculturalism policy was introduced in 1971, those became sort of um, official imprimaturs put on phenomena that had already become a fairly integral part of the fabric of Canadian life. That doesn't mean it was a utopia of tolerance or anything like that, but it meant that the idea of a growing population coming from all over the world um, was, was, was not a particularly controversial one. It, it, and, and that caused a whole lot of other things to topple over, as, as I know. And we experienced five decades of very difficult struggles over what Canada is. We, three constitutional uh, amendment attempts, one of which was successful, uh, two secession crises, a rising, uh, a still incomplete rising of indigenous political consciousness and action, uh, and, uh, and some fights over things like immigration and culture that and, oh, and, and a big battle in the 1980s over whether we were part of a British colonial economy or part of a North American economy, um, which were all tough and, 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 and politically fraught, but would reach an interesting point where despite having very polarized politics after 2000, Canada reached a point where on basic issues of the shape of its growth and population and the ideas of being a multi-ethnic uh, country and a country that requires population growth, there was a p consensus reached by about 2010 in all the major political mm -hmm. parties of the country and most of the major constituencies of the country. So we're left with the question of where do we stand as far as how we developed before? What, how are the sort of snail tracks of that first century of development still crisscrossing the Canadian fabric. Um, we did not develop cities in order to be cities. We developed them because we sort of thought they were an afterthought 
I mean, well into the 20th century, we thought our cities were a coincidence caused by the wheat boom. Uh, that our in industries were, it was widely believed for a long time that our the steel industry developing in Sydney and Hamilton and Sault Ste. Marie were simply coincidences caused by the fact that the CPR had pushed west and, and as a result of the wheat boom. In fact, the CPR never bought rails from uh, Canadian uh, steel makers. Uh, and and by, uh, by the middle of the first decade of the 20th century, the, lead, the industries that were leading Canadian growth were things like chemicals and steel and automobiles and electric turbines uh, and things like that. And, and the wheat boom, while it was a real boom and we had become the breadbasket of the world, was actually a pretty tiny fraction uh, of our economic growth. Because we didn't recognize that, because our policies saw our cities as being uh, an afterthought, we, we sort of allowed them to just become smudges on the landscape. The, the, the sort of urban planning characteristic of Canadian cities, in, including Toronto, is they never really had a center because they never thought of themselves as being central places. They thought of themselves as being accumulations of sort of livestock markets here and, uh, and a pile of houses here and an awful lot of churches all over the place, but did not see themselves as being the centerpieces of Canada. I've argued before that Toronto was a city built by its suburbs uh, over the years, and, and that form of growth happened a lot of places in Canada. So we were left with very low population densities in our cities, um, and cities that did not cluster together in the ideal ways to create economies and to create ecologies of efficiency. Um, and, and we were left with, with a lot of infrastructure built for a form of east-west trade that had ceased to be significant. Uh, uh, well, into the 20th century. And we were left with a number of other problems that, that, weren't, that, that we're beginning to feel now. Now, we have among the highest living standards in the world. Um, we, we, we do not suffer. And, uh, but when, when you look at the question of the population deficit hanging over us for those years, we're talking about a number of things. We're not in an era anymore where, where we would ever need mass immigration in Canada. Uh, if we were to have the immigration levels today that we had in the Laurier years, we'd have two million people a year coming into Canada, 1.75 million people a year coming into Canada. Um, we have about 300,000, which is just enough to keep our population slowly creeping upward and, and fiscal catastrophe at bay. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, we, there's no need for mass immigration because we do not have the form of economy or culture anymore that requires millions of people to put into armies or to work in factories or to work in, in, in the fields. Uh, we don't have that type of economy and, and nobody will anymore. Um, the places where underpopulation is felt instead are in our capacity to do things and our capacity to solve problems, particularly in the coming difficult def decades when, now that we're sort of in a post-globalization era, now that, we're, uh, not, now that we're in an era of demographic challenge, and now that, now that we're attempting to create a carbon neutral economy, we find that we do not have the right concentrations of people in the right places to be able to sustain the right things uh, in the right future. And I look at population as being a matter of, first of all, very simply a fiscal base of a group of people who will support a set of government, and government, governments and institutions and expenditures and projects to allow us to do things um, at a cost we can afford. Second of all is a set of markets um, to allow us to be economically independent, particularly since the model of economic model business success that had, that, that had sort of defined Canadian big business over the last 20 or 30 years, which we, as some people call the direct to global model, is much, much more difficult now. Uh, having a company like BlackBerry emerge and flourish and employ tens of thousands of people, again, would be very difficult in the economy now that the things that we call to globalization have, have retreated and, and appear to be in greater retreat. Uh, the, the, the international retreating of supply chains back to the national level that we've seen during the last 10 years is, um, it, makes thing, it makes it much more difficult to do things without a domestic uh, market. Our, our domestic supply chains are much more limited. 
the growth of um, prefer national, nationalist prefer preferential purchasing policies by the biggest governments in the world, India, China, and the United States, has made it much more difficult because the, the companies in those countries have a guaranteed first buyer in the forms of government purchasing, and they also have research and development subsidies from those governments at large levels that Canadian companies can attempt to fall back on, but we simply don't have the size of consumer market or the size of government here in Canada to be able to do that. It'd be very hard for Canadian companies to become sort of those huge employers again with the limited domestic markets. We have a limited audience size for culture, for media, for things like that, that anybody who's involved in a cultural industry or educational or media industry in Canada knows we do not have enough people to have a lot of the institutions of sort of national dialogue and conversation and culture that we'd like to have. We used to complain about that a few decades ago about the, this being, the consequence of this being the Americanization of Canadian culture because all of our movies and TV and et cetera were from the United States. We're a little bit more at peace with that now, um, possibly just because a generation who's grown up who's used to that, or, and, but also because there was a flowering of Canadian culture partly due to smart subsidies, partly due to generations coming of age who, who learned to be successful abroad and then bring some of it back here uh, that's allowed us to overcome that. But still the problem is that our, our audiences are too small to have many cultural or media or, or printed word institutions that are more than one or two people in a room. Uh, it's often said that the, you know, the, way, the, the minimum size of readership you needed, you needed to do a small magazine, and I would say the same is true of small website, in the United States was 100,000. Uh, you scale that back to, the, that was enough to pay for a few people in a room to be editors and that sort of thing, somebody to run circulation. Uh, you scale that to the Canadian level, it's, that's 10,000, or if, you're, if it's just English Canada, 8,000. And with, with, with 8,000, Meta knows about this, right? Peace Magazine maybe has a, a few more readers than that, I don't know. But, it doesn't. <laughs> and your global media empire with its hundreds of people in your, uh, in your, in your towers is a... Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's good. I've, I've joked that the subtitle of this book should have been, or why a book like this won't allow me to retire in Florida. <laughs> sort of a self it's, a, it's, a it's a conspiracy theory to get the book buying audience up large enough to uh, sell more books like this. Um, but anyway. Audiences, um, clusters of expertise and knowledge is, the other, uh, is another population category that we are short of. We do, not have, we do not have the areas where people live tight together who have, who have specialized skills with the right infrastructure to support those skills and allow, allow us to have uh, a Silicon Valley or a Silicon Alley or a Silicon Roundabout. That's what they call the area in, in London where all the uh, high-tech businesses are. Silicon Roundabout, anyway. Um, and finally, our cities. And this is, this is a large problem, too. And this is particularly a problem of sustainability. Because our cities were built with very low population density. Uh, Toronto and Vancouver, despite everyone complaining about the traffic, uh, are cities of whose biggest obstacles are caused by their low population density. Never mind Montreal, Calgary, or, or, or Edmonton, or, or Halifax. Um, and in fact, if you think about it, you realize the reason why people feel crowded on the Lionsgate Bridge or, or, or on the Don Valley Parkway or, or get it, trying to get off the island in Montreal is because of low population density. The reason why we have to we think about our infrastructure, the reason why instead of saying, I got up this morning and went to work in a Canadian city, you say, I got up this morning and got to work and then put a paragraph in between that about the blue line on the subway or about the, about the King Streetcar or something. You, infrastructure should be something you don't feel and you don't think about. Uh, we don't have enough of it because our population density is so low. The reason why people are stuck on the Gardner is because we don't have two-thirds of the drivers taken off the Gardner and going on the uh, downtown relief line or something like that. And well, partly that's a question of political will, mainly it's a question of population density. We do not have the concentrations of people in cities in the right areas to support the infrastructure we need and to support the transition to green infrastructure and carbon neutral infrastructure that we need. 
And that's becoming a social problem as well because the places where people settle in Canada are no longer the dense downtown Chinatowns and Little Italy's where we could follow a very distinctly mo Canadian model of integration that I've written about elsewhere, which is the model, and the United States is, it was also for many years the leading model of integration, where you settle, you come from a mud floor village somewhere, you settle in the densely populated downtown of a city, you rent and then eventually buy a house in a disreputable neighborhood. You start a small business, maybe a shop or a restaurant, in often in the very building that you live in or nearby, you can count on decent numbers of people with money to be walking past because of, because of the combination of social classes and backgrounds that exist in the dense downtown. And the incomes from that small business and the rising value of the house that you've bought become sources of both social capital and real capital that you use to finance the expansion of your small business and post-secondary education of your children. Uh, and that model of integration which worked very well for probably a century, is no longer possible. All immigration in Canada takes place in the suburbs. All immigration in North America takes place in the suburbs. Interestingly now, all poverty in Canada, all the, the, an inordinate share of poverty in Canada is in the suburbs and so on. And you start, you're starting to see strains. You're starting to see places where people settle becoming physically isolated because they have low population density. You can't open a small business in the building you live in. Probably not allowed. If you do, there's, no, there's not enough people coming past. The empty spaces between buildings are forbidding and, and keep you from moving, and this is a particularly gendered form of isolation that, that, that means women are often, often feel trapped and unable to, to go out uh, at certain times or, or, or to engage in the economy. <coughs> families remain trapped in, uh, in structures that, that don't work to their benefit. And, and there's, there's a danger, and we see the political stresses in that. I would argue that the defining political phenomenon of the sort of age of, of low density uh, population growth was, was the election of Rob Ford. It was an interesting phenomenon. He was a populist right wing, explicitly racist politician who lobbied against immigration into Toronto as if that were something that could be done. Um, and who was elected by a group of people who are mainly racial and religious minorities, uh, and uh, who lived in the inner suburbs of, of the city, um, who felt a great sense of resentment at the privilege of the white uh, wealthy class who lived in the dense downtown and so on. And that lesson taught us, first of all, that, that, that these forms of resentment, that the, that the racialized uh, segregation of, of, of immigration and poverty into the low-density suburbs has political consequences. It taught us that Canada could be the unique country that could have uh, one of the most di ethnically diverse uh, far-right populist movements in the world, which I don't really want to be our uh, contrib contribution to diversity in politics. Uh, but it also taught, the, taught us that there are, there are strains in the, in the polities of Canada caused by low population density and places where people live. And part of my analysis in, in Maximum Canada is to look at um, the capacity to do things at low population density and, and the needs to overcome those things. It is very difficult to find a pathway to meeting Paris uh, Agreement goals to moving toward uh, a carbon neutral future based on the low population density that we have. Um, it's very hard to imagine a transition to, to green forms of transportation, heating, building design, and, and energy generation within a reasonable period of time with the low population densities we're trying to string infrastructure uh, across. We, we, we are not, never mind to pay for the infrastructure defenses against climate change, the ocean, the ocean level rut barriers, the defenses against extreme weather conditions and so on, which are only possible in places of the highest population density with the concentration of fiscal resources uh, that come from that. So I spend a lot of time looking at what sort of a sustainable population is. What is, what is, what is a, and it's not really a matter of absolute population and, and zeros and that sort of thing, but what are the clusters of people we need at the right densities to, to allow us to shift along what some people call the, 
environmental Kuznets curve where, where, where at a certain level of wealth, the candidate has already developed. Each addition of people to, to an urban area causes a decrease in per capita and, and then eventually net uh, carbon output. Uh, by, the tran by, the, by the shift to sustainable uh, infrastructure, by the reduction of travel distances and so on. I mean, it's not a small thing. By my estimation, about half of Canada's greenhouse gas output is caused by inefficiencies related to low urban population density. Our largest single contribution of emissions most years is private automobile use. And most of that, the largest share of that, is, is private passenger automobiles in urban areas. The second largest is the heating of homes, which is overwhelmingly uh, dominated by inefficient single-family homes that, that <coughs> are very expensive to heat. A, a shift from single-family homes to apartment living built, in, uh, built, using, built to green standards like they have in California would, would, be, it would be a very dramatic shift to carbon neutral. And then third, of course, the, the reliance on fossil fuel generation in many parts of Canada. Uh, between those three, about, that's about 50% of our carbon output. So, so the, the shift to higher population density in a sustainable population would be, would be the key factor in allowing us to make the transition, both because of those factors I mentioned and because of the fiscal resources that would be available for that, for that shift. And a, another part of it is just the question of how are we going to handle our, our future decades of growth? What, do we want to have our, there is going to be another tripling of the Canadian population at some point. Um, we tripled our population between 1945 and 2015 without, I mean, I think it caused an enhancement, despite what Harold Innes said, it caused an enhancement rather than a decrease of Canadian culture and values. It caused a, uh, it caused, it didn't run us out of food, it caused a huge increase in agricultural production uh, uh, and, and productivity per hectare, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so on. In, unless some calamity happens, we will have population growth. Um, and a lot of what Maximum Canada is about is not calling for specific population growth targets. We have, every, we have both major federal political parties doing that now. Uh, but it's rather saying, what are the obstacles? What are, what are the re a reason why the key chapter in this is called the case against 100 million is because it's saying, let's put the brakes on and let's, let's look at what needs to be done before we talk about increasing the population. Let's talk about the investments that need to be made so that that increase, it, again, it causes a rise in equality, in, in, uh, in a, a, rise, a, a decrease in poverty rates so that it causes it, uh, a, a shift toward uh, a carbon neutral economy and not a shift away from it. And, and we need to do several things before we can talk about doing that. Um, among the key sort of obstacles to population growth identified. Uh, let me start with the flip side of that. It, there is some sense in trying to, trying to uh, embrace population growth now rather than later. Part of which is that uh, it's going to be much more difficult to get and attract uh, people, highly skilled people, but really people in general, during the second half of this century. The parts of the world that are approaching a population transition are very high, and they include a lot of the sending countries uh, to Canada. The number of countries that are approaching population shrinkage uh, that include China, which is almost there. It's taking in immigrants from Africa to try to fill its labor shortages. Uh, Iran, major immigration country to Canada, as I was pointing out, went from eight children per family in the 1980s to 1.7 children per family in the last decade, and is is if it weren't for refugees arriving from Afghanistan, we'd have a shrinking population now. Countries like Lebanon and United Emirates and, and Tunisia have, have shrinkage level populations. Uh, Bangladesh is approaching that point, uh, and so on. So it's, 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 it's going to be, we're going to reach a period sort of mid-century that I call peak people. Um, you know, people talked about this idea called peak oil a number of years back, when, when, when we were going to have all sorts of calamities when uh, oil, oil started being a, a matter of scarcity rather than supply. Didn't quite, unfortunately, work out that way. But uh, 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 something like that is something we have to watch out with, with human populations. We are reaching a point when advanced countries are going to be having to compete with each other very aggressively to attract newcomers rather than to try to restrict them. 
through policy because the supply will have run short. Canada will always be an attractive country to people, but not that necessarily attractive. <laughs> Keep in mind, of people who emigrate out of Britain today, still there's, there's four who emigrate to Australia for every one who goes to Canada. That one might be the weather. Um, with the Syrian refugees, we found something like three out of four that we offered refuge and asylum in Canada said no thank you after examining the place. Now that was partly because we didn't have networks of existing people here, but it was, it was also because we, 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 should, we shouldn't pretend that we're an immediate draw. So part of it is, is recognizing we sh if, if we're going to do this, we might want to do it sooner rather than later, but also that we need to make the investments in advance. And those include our housing crisis. And our housing crisis is also a crisis of population density in our cities. Um, we have a housing supply shortage, as anybody in Toronto or Vancouver or, or Montreal knows. And we need to address that. Um, and we need to address that without causing urban sprawl. I would argue that the era of urban sprawl is over anyway. The, the era of cities expanding across farm fields. That economy doesn't work that well anymore. There's no longer any sort of either market or social bonus in buying a big spread on the edge of town. It's now quite expensive and not very desirable in the market, and people don't really want to do it. There's a reason why a really crummy semi without a finished basement in Little Italy currently, if you look at the listings, sells for more than twice as much per square foot as a big house in Rosedale. Um, that people want, that there's a market bonus for density and tight knit neighborhoods. Uh, right now, and also municipal authorities do not want to allow further sprawl across green belts and that sort of thing, because the cost of extending sewage and water and electrical infrastructure and all that sort of stuff versus the tax return from such low, low density growth is unsustainable economically for most polities. So we need to watch out for that stuff. We need to recognize that, that uh, growth is going to be inward. It's going to be infill. It's going to be turning our single family neighborhoods into places with various forms of housing. It's going to be filling in the empty spaces. Tomorrow night I'm going to be talking at an uh, uh, urban planning conference at the Brickworks that's uh, um, devoted to a new planning, a new zoning initiative that Toronto has developed that's known as tower renewal. Because of course the characteristic form of housing in not just in Toronto, but in Canadian cities in general, that the one distinctly and, and, and large scale form of Canadian housing is the slab farm in the suburbs. It's the suburban apartment block we've done more than any other country, and it, it's the place where people settle. We have 2,000 of them in Toronto alone, which is home. They, they, those, those are now the major sites of settlement and immigration in Canada, the slab farms, farms in the suburbs, and of, you know, those large fields of 20 or 30 story apartment buildings built in the 50s and 60s. People like living in the apartments, but they are forbidding forms of living. They do not develop economies and have such low pop apartment buildings <laughs> anywhere except Manhattan or low, low population density places. So, uh, and, and which have problems of social deprivation, isolation due to that. So we have a zoning um, thing, which is a very small start in Toronto that allows the owners of those buildings without even applying for permission to build up the space, the, those grassy spaces between buildings with shops markets, eventually, hopefully, mid-rise housing uh, to increase the density and the economic activity, to allow the people settling there to have safe spaces between buildings, where to, to feel like they can walk at night, but also places where they can run a shop and have customers and, and that sort of thing. And that form of build-up has huge capacity in Canadian cities. We can easily double our populations uh, of our major cities, simply filling in those, those underused, frightening, empty spaces, which allow for more tight-knit communities in filling up and, and doing that. We need to address the, the, the housing supply crisis in this way, uh, not, not just for any projected population growth and, and immigration, but for existing populations in Canada now, for our own children and grandchildren, and, uh, uh, and so on. Another area that needs to be addressed is, is the structure of the labor market. The old model of settling in Canada, the cliche was you came and you got a full-time job at the factory and there was a pension and all that. It was always a little bit more complicated. I mean, even in the, night, the sort of golden age of those factory jobs in the 1950s, the Italians and Greeks and so on who settled tended to have a mixture of those factory jobs and a little shop and some buy and sell here and, and that sort of the portfolios of the poor, as they call them in uh, development. But now that is the only norm for a lot of people, is a portfolio of small business opportunities, contracts, gig economy things, 
uh, buy and sell hustles and that sort of thing, which often add up to the same amount of money on the T4 at the end of the year, um, or the T1, I should say, but, uh, but which do not have the income security and support. So we need to look at an income support system for a more fragmented and informalized uh, form of employment. Again, not just for the next tens of millions of Canadians coming in, but for our own children and grand grandchildren. We need, to, we need to change the way we recognize skills and, and credentials earned in other countries. Um, most people who arrive in Canada, 60% of people who arrive in Canada have university degrees. That's twice the rate of Canadian born Canadians. But only at best one in five, and by some measures, <coughs> half, half that ever end up working in the area in which they received their expensive post-secondary education. The old cliche that every taxi driver in Toronto has a master's degree is not that far from the truth. Um, because they need a couple more years of post-secondary to get those degrees recognized to Canadian standards. They can't do that because they're busy trying to put their own kids in, through education, and we don't have any supports for that. And it's meant that we've quietly haven't noticed the, the, the offshoot of that phenomenon, which is that the big places of growth are becoming what we call the second tier cities. Um, the post-industrial, smaller cities of Canada, and specifically the ones that have post-secondary institutions in them. That's where immigrants want to go now. Uh, to Kelowna, Lethbridge, uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, Hamilton, Kingston, Trois-Rivières, Moncton, Halifax, and so on. Places where you can actually afford to buy a house, where there's a university, and where there's a city that actually wants you because these cities have, have have lost their fiscal basis badly in their post-industrial years and want to refresh them. Uh, those cities, though, aren't quite ready. They need investments in infrastructure. They need investments in, in data infrastructure. They, they need to be turned into the places where tight clusters of high-skilled people uh, want to settle in. And they should increase their size and population dramatically and turn into major hubs of, of, uh, of business and knowledge and, and, and community and, and, uh, and education and so on. Those are investments, again, a set of investments we need to make for the near future anyway and so on. A large part of this, in other words, and, I, and anyway, I chronicle a bunch of other things that require investment up front now before we should do that. As I say, during the last 70 years when we tripled our population, we got lucky. We had the right housing in the right cities and the right jobs in the right places for the right people who happened to arrive. And we generally did all the other stuff as an afterthought. We said, oh my God, we've just doubled the population of Toronto. We'd better build a couple of schools. And it's a big reason why the architectural design of half the high schools in Toronto looks exactly the same. <laughs> we just sort of said around 1965, oh geez, we better build some schools. We can't get lucky uh, during our next increase in population. We have to get skilled. We have to employ our skills in advance so that, so that the population growth is a tool for sustainability rather than a threat to sustainability. And uh, uh, so a lot of this is sort of, it's sort of a trick of the light where I say, I, I, I point out the investments we need to make to increase the population, but then I note that all, all of those are things that we need to be doing anyway, even if we were to have some political party that wanted to freeze the population. We would, we would in fact benefit from those investments. So in a way you could say that what I'm saying here is let's have a mindset, let's have a policy exercise in Canada as if we were going to be tripling our population. Because even if we don't, even if, even if we have the calamity of not population non-growth, uh, we still will need those investments for the people who are coming in to Canada by the more traditional way of crawling out of somebody's womb. And, uh, and, and we should develop an official mindset and a popular mindset of assuming that the population will triple again uh, because it'll allow us to do it right and because it'll allow us to treat ourselves right because we, we, we deserve at least the infrastructure for a larger Canada if not an actual larger Canada. Thank you very much.